Hi, I'm Andrew. This um, meeting is being recorded. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Andrew, and this is my colleague Dylan, and we're going to talk about some of the work we've been doing at Google with trying to get our kernel development more upstream friendly. So today we're going to go over kernel development at Google and its issues, and we're going to try to present our solution and its generally applicable themes in the hopes that it'll help other people um, sort of pull out ways that they can apply this in their own job or life. And then we'll end with our current progress and looking forward what we hope to achieve. So the first thing we'll talk about is how kernel development uh, sort of works at Google. Um, more so in the past and a bit of the present, we're trying to change it. So this might be a little bit backwards looking now. So we have a kernel called prod kernel and it's a fork of the Linux kernel that Google deploys on its production systems. So it's what's running in all the servers that are in Google's data centers. It adds about 9,000 patches on top of the upstream Linux kernel. Um, these patches do a bunch of different things, right? There's internal APIs, there's specialized hardware support, performance optimizations, and uh, some specific security stuff. Um, but they're things that for one reason or another, one reason or another never made it upstream. And then about every two years, we try to rebase all these patches over a two-year code base delta. As you can imagine, that's a pretty hefty task to take 9,000 patches and pull them over two years, especially because some of them are pretty intrusive into some core subsystems. So sort of why do we have prod kernel? Um, we had internal needs and timelines that necessitated having our own fork of Linux. Uh, some examples, we have a method for setting quality of service for outgoing network traffic, um, specific funny rules for OOM kills. Uh, we have a cooperative scheduling API, um, which actually is trying to go upstream now, um, called UMCG. And then in perf, we have stuff to disable sampling of the user stack in the perf tool because it could contain user data. Um, so some of these things, they probably could have been sent upstream, but Again, for one reason or another, they did not make it. So some problems that we observed with the current process that we use to inform how we want to change the process and see what we could fix. So one of the main, or the main hurdle is that Google made features are currently developed and tested in Prod Kernel, which is two years behind upstream. So this presents two major hurdles with getting patches upstream now. Um, we have to rebase the feature across a multi-year delta to get it to upstream. And even if we do that, we need to retest it on its newly rebased upstream. Um, so you can imagine if you have a patch set that's based on a kernel from two years ago and you test it in Google production workloads. Um, and then suddenly, and if you want to get it upstream, you have to rebase it all uh, two years ahead uh, to the present time. And now it's basically untested. So while a feature might have been validated against Google production workloads on its old upstream base, um, there's no real good way to replicate that on the new upstream base without the rest of prod kernel, right? Because you tested this old patch set um, on top of prod kernel with all the other features that are there. And now you're testing it in a totally different environment with a totally different kernel. So that presents, presents a pretty major hurdle in terms of testing. Um, bug discovery is another thing that sort of hurts us, right? So we have complex workloads at large scales mm -hmm. and, oh, sorry, did someone say something? No, all right. So this sets us up to discover, discover lots of system bottlenecks and deadlocks and other things like that. The nature of our rebase means that there's a very large delay in discovery and diagnosis um, in the sense that we will we can probably find bugs on year old kernels since that's what we are running, but not uh, currently upstream kernels. So this means like, even if we do find a bug, um, it doesn't really benefit many people outside of us, especially if we fix it because we're fixing a bug that's present in a like years old kernel. And then this also means that we can't uh, benefit from upstream help, right? So even if we said, oh, we found this bug on this kernel, um, the rest of the world is currently much past that. So by staying on a certain major for an extended period of time, a bug could have been fixed upstream, but it won't benefit. We won't benefit until we rebase again, or we manually find the fix and backport it. And then another thing that sort of bites us is platform support and backporting. So as upstream adds support for new platforms, we have two choices. We can either 
backport the patches for these platforms or we just won't have that platform support until we rebase. And this issue is kind of generalizable to all backports. Um, we need to backport over a large delta. And even then, it does, it's, uh, the patch isn't being tested against the same kernel version it was developed for. So we encounter bugs that might not even be applicable to upstream. And just in terms of resource cost, um, this method of rebasing over such a large delta is extremely costly. Um, individual patches end up having to have their conflicts resolved against the new upstream base. Um, for some patches, there isn't too much uh, difficulty in doing this, but for other patches that are pretty intrusive, there's a lot of conflicts that have to sort of be figured out and that are not trivial. And then additionally, the entire kernel ends up having to be requalified against Google's workloads with the new base. Um, this opens up a very, very large like uh, search space if we find bugs. So we might rebase some patches and throw tests at it. And if these tests fail, suddenly it's like, uh, are they failing because of something that happened in the two-year code delta or did we rebase wrong? So you're not even sure like where to look at the first point. And then dependencies among these patches are pretty inconsistently documented making it really hard to parallelize the rebase effort. And then the delay associated with the rebase um, is just kind of a negative feedback loop, right? The longer the rebase takes, the further behind upstream you are. And then next time when you try to do it again, you'll be even further behind and it'll take even longer. And um, this is kind of supported by some of the statistics we've collected. Every rebase is taking longer and longer. Um, we are rebasing more and more patches. And effectively, it seems like our technical debt is just going up without any, uh, any bound. Um, so not even uh, just like an increase in time and how long it takes to uh, rebase, but also an increase in the number of patches that we need to rebase. And, the time delta is also increasing. Uh, structurally, this means that our engineers are working on a year old kernel, which like we discussed, presents the hurdle of a possibly larger rebase for any new feature they want to get upstream. And more practically, um, everyone's time is limited, right? So if we're asking people to rebase, that's time they could have been participating upstream instead. And if we sort of generalize the issue, uh, there are two basic issues we run into by not being close to upstream. We can't passively benefit from near upstream development, meaning that uh, if someone puts a new feature upstream, we don't just get it for free. We have to work pretty hard to actually ingest it into our kernel. And by not being upstream, we also uh, just have more internal patches um, because we're developing against something that is so far from upstream that it doesn't usually make sense from an engineer's point of view to upstream the patches. And these two kind of feed off each other and make the problem worse. Um, and yeah, now I'll hand it over to Dylan uh, to sort of discuss uh, our hopeful solution for this. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so yeah, uh, what, do we, what do we do about this uh, giant technical debt problem? Um, so our team is to introduce a new kind of kernel, the icebreaker kernel, um, to, to sort of present itself as an alternative to the current uh, prod kernel. Uh, so uh, there's some general themes to this part of the presentation. We want to stay close to upstream. Um, and sort of the uh, concrete goal about that is to say, all right, we want to release an icebreaker kernel for every um, major upstream version of Linux. And so that sort of forces us to say, OK, we do have to sort of qualify and test and release all of our patches, at least at some sort of regular cadence. Um, and we want to use this to encourage upstream contribution um, with the idea being that if we, we are currently close to upstream, uh, it should be pretty reasonable to expect engineers to start sending things upstream and start paying down our technical debt. Um, and in order to do this, we need to uh, test a lot um, at both the granularity of individual kernel features and also at um, larger kernel-wide tests. And then sort of the other side of this is we want to be able to uh, deploy this icebreaker kernel in production um, at sort of a limited capacity um, to actually like qualify upstream Linux in production before it gets to prod kernel, you know, two years later. Uh, next slide. Oh, thanks. Um, so what makes this important? It's really just all about upstream engagement. Um, as Andrew kind of alluded to before, 
an engineer working on um, a kernel feature um, is sort of creating technical debt inherently, right? Um, and they're sort of faced with two options, right? They can either propose it upstream and it sort of has this uh, ambiguous amount of time that they have to wait to get feedback. They don't know if it's gonna get accepted. Um, they don't know how much work it's gonna take or they can say, uh, I'm not gonna do any of that. Um, I'm just going to you know, wait till later. And at some point, you know, the kernel org is gonna say, all right, we're gonna set aside some time to do this rebase and I'll do it at that point in time. And I know that I have that time set aside. Um, and so it's like sort of a delayed and certain outcome. And so we wanna get out of that cycle using um, the icebreaker kernel. So the other side of this is we want to qualify upstream kernels against uh, Google production workloads. And so we have a, a pretty large uh, fleet and it, it doesn't make sense to sort of try and fix every kernel bug we discover. And so it makes sense to just consume upstream um, kernel releases to consume other people's bug fixes. Um, and then at the same time, um, we become better upstream citizens by simply being better um, Linux users, right? If we deploy in our very large fleet uh, a much newer version of Linux that gives um, a lot more exposure and a lot more coverage to Linux and we can help report bugs uh, to upstream. So how do we make this actually happen? Um, there's sort of two sides to this. There's actual uh, development uh, on Icebreaker and then there's upgrading uh, our existing patch set um, on top of the, the new versions of upstream Linux. And so the SCM is uh, trying its best to be optimized for um, developing and then staying close to upstream. Um, so the basic icebreaker structure is we start with um, an upstream release and then we fork off from that. Uh, next slide, please. And then, so we basically create these um, feature branches. And what a feature branch is, is just uh, vanilla Linux with some patches on top of it that sort of constitute um, any feature. And sort of the, the nice thing about this is that um, these patches are, are more or less what you would consider like a, a patch series uh, that you would propose upstream. So the idea is that um, we're introducing to our repository a, a patch series that could be um, proposed upstream and we're keeping it on a branch just like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, one more. Um, so developer development um, on these branches happens. We can get bug fixes and stuff. Um, next slide. And then eventually they get merged into uh, a per system, subsystem uh, staging branch. Um, and these staging branches are sort of uh, fully featured kernels. So they go through more testing. And next slide, please. And um, eventually we do sort of a fan in, what we call a fan in merge process uh, to our, our, our next branch, which is sort of like where the release actually happens of the icebreaker kernel. Um, and so in that process, everything gets merged together, it gets qualified. And then finally, um, we do a, a fan out merge where we actually merge back out to the staging branches so everything is sort of reset back to um, the, the state of the, the universal state of icebreaker. Um, and an important thing to note here is that uh, the fan out doesn't actually happen to feature branches. Feature branches continue to be isolated vanilla Linux with just these patches on top of it. So taking a closer look at a feature branch, um, how do we actually do an upgrade? And this happens on the feature branch level. So if we actually um, are developing on say 5.10 and we wanna get into 5.11, what we do is we create a, a new feature branch for 5.11 um, and then we merge the 5.10 branch onto the 5.11 branch. And so when that happens, we're creating a merge commit and uh, we can resolve any conflicts in that commit with the idea being that we're just resolving conflicts for that feature and not for you know, all of prod kernel. And so it actually is kind of manageable to do it in that one merge commit. And then that sort of has the added benefit of saying, okay, well, um, we actually can keep 
our, our stable SHA ones for past commits because uh, we didn't actually rebase anything. We are continuing the history of uh, the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so for bug fixes, let's say our oldest supported version is uh, Linux 5.10. If we have a bug that we discover in there and say there's some SHA-1 that introduces the bug, um, we can introduce a fix and we have, you know, say a footer that says fixes this SHA-1 um, that fixes the bug. And so we fix it in 5.10 and then we just do, do another merge forward uh, to actually propagate the fix forward into the latest version of Icebreaker. And so um, in this context, um, that actual fixes footer is uh, really meaningful, right? Because um, the, the SHA-1 is totally stable. It doesn't change. Um, there's only one SHA-1 that introduced the bug and there's one SHA-1 that fixes the bug and it remains constant through the full history of that feature. Uh, next slide. Um, so um, staying close to upstream uh, means that these features can be easily upgraded um, and proposed upstream at any point in time. Um, but there's sort of this caveat that kind of, it, it ends up being very important that we, we test feature branches um, at the feature branch level, right? Because when we do this merge forward, um, we need to revalidate the feature at that point in time because there's this new merge commit. Um, and so having automated like real written tests um, can make that like much easier. So um, upstream contributions should be a, a lot more doable in this context. Um, to actually take a feature branch with all these weird merge commits and turn it into a, a patch series again for upstream. Um, it is a, more or less just a, a git rebase. And if you have git re-re-re-enabled, um, the, the ideal scenario is that you just do the rebase and you're done. Um, sometimes it doesn't always work out that simply, uh, but at the end of the day, the, um, the information of like, how do I resolve these conflicts is stored in these merge, com uh, merge commits. And so, even if it is a little bit complicated to resolve the conflicts again, um, the work has been done once before somewhere. And so we can extract that information. And at the end of the rebase, we can actually compare tree IDs to make sure that we actually do end up with the same, um, uh, the, the same rebased feature um, that we can propose upstream. Next slide, please. So I'll take it over from Dylan and talk a little bit about uh, the tooling we've built around Icebreaker. So um, all the stuff we've talked about with the source control model and how development works and how upgrading works is uh, Andrew, it's, it's very a... useful, but it's a little bit, um, it would be very difficult if we didn't have any automation around it because there are many mechanical steps involved. So in theory, the aforementioned ideas, they should work, they, they make sense, right? You're keeping basically feature branches, which are just patch sets that you could send upstream, and then you're combining them together into staging branches and a release branch to create the kernel that we want. Um, but there are many steps that need to be taken, and it is likely the case that a developer doesn't want to be responsible for some of these certain mechanical tasks. So a developer might just be concerned with developing his, developing his feature, and um, this person probably doesn't want to worry about, okay, like, uh, do I need to merge it into the staging branch or um, how do I know that all my tests are passing and I didn't break anyone else's tests? So for stuff like this um, to work, we need some very well-oiled automation. Andrew, but one of the, um, Andrew, this starting at like the smallest level that we can, we have feature branches. So when a developer uploads a patch set, uh, we automatically run build tests across a variety of configs and architectures. And um, this is pretty useful because you might be a developer and you might just check that it builds for one thing, or maybe you have a script that runs a variety of build tests against your patch series. Um, but what we found is really useful is like, uh, if we can just take that sort of worry out of the developer's hands. So all they have to do is upload um, their changes and then the tests get run automatically and you can see very clearly that they passed or not. 
We also validate the commit message and its metadata. So in the sense that this will keep people thinking about upstream in the sense that uh, the commit message is something that we'd be okay proposing upstream. All this ensures that if a developer ends up wanting to send a feature branch upstream, it's already in a very good state. Likely all they have to do is um, rebase it to the latest version of Linux, which as Dylan sort of mentioned, uh, is a much easier task than it would be in the prod kernel world. Andrew, there is a um, hand up. Uh, would you like to take the question? I don't know if it's for you or Dylan. Sure. Um, Pascal Lambert, could you, you, you could ask the question. Yeah. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I was question for Dylan. So just to summarize what you showed previously. So in a sense, the idea of uh, the icebreaker is to create little bundle patches of those features so they can be accepted into the upstream, right? That's the whole point basically of the branching yeah. strategy. To sort of have things separated, um, it makes it more parallelizable. Um, and th those branches can't always be, you know, sent directly upstream, they have to still be rebased. But um, the idea is that it's, it's much more manageable um, when everything's separated into future branches. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question, Dylan, um, on one of the uh, topics that you presented earlier in terms of you said that you would do a uh, test on a feature on a feature branch. Um, you might have two features, say, that you have branches for those separate branches. How do you make sure then that those two features interact well when you? take it up to the icebreaker. Right, so um, yeah, there is this other side that we haven't, we didn't talk about too much um, that has to do with uh, dependency between feature branches. Um, the, the actual um, testing of the isolated feature branch, um, I, I think is important just to make sure that it works on its own, um, but we do still test um, the fully merged staging branch. Um, and then there's this sort of other component, which is that um, if we do find out that like, you know, merging one feature branch with another breaks one of the tests or um, pretty commonly, you know, there's actually a merge conflict between feature branches because they just modify code near each other or there's actual like an API dependency between two feature branches. Um, then we say, okay, there's, there's an actual dependency between these feature branches. And so it's no longer quite as simple, um, but it's still manageable. We, we basically say, okay, there's going to be a merge between the two feature branches on the actual feature branch and not um, just on the staging branch any longer. And then uh, when we upgrade, we can manage that dependency by saying, okay, well, the, um, the original feature branch that the other feature branch depends on will be upgraded first and then merged over into the um, the, the dependent feature branch uh, every time we upgrade so we can properly propagate the dependencies. Um, so that is something we kind of have to deal with, but I, I think a, a, a core assumption of icebreaker is that there aren't too many interdependent features like that. Did that, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, let me find my place. Um... Yeah, so we just talked about feature branch testing, I guess also in the um, context of the questions asked. So that's one level of testing, right? Making sure that the patch set works on its own. Um, so that is good in the sense that you can now propose it to upstream and point to tests and say, hey, I ran them against this patch set and it works. Um, and then eventually these feature branches, they all get merged into a staging branch together. And this is where things, uh, this is where we have our next level of testing. So while we've already validated that these features work independently on their own, we still need to validate that they actually work together, right? Um, like Dylan said, sometimes there's merge conflicts between features because they modify code that's around the same area. So suddenly when you merge them together, you're actually introducing new code. So what we do here is these staging branches, um, they have a select subset of all the tests that we run um, we run them against these staging branches as smoke tests. So what this looks like is a subsystem maintainer will 
uh, start merging individual feature branches. And on each of these merges, we'll run this subset of tests to make sure that we didn't break anything. Um, and then this gives the subsystem maintainer uh, some confidence in the health of their subsystem, right? So they might have had to go and resolve merge conflicts that introduced sort of new code, and they're able to upload this merge conflict resolution, have the test run automatically against it, and they'll see it's all green and say, OK, I have confidence that the resolution is actually correct. And um, by introducing this new feature A, it didn't break test for feature B. And then going up one further level, um, our release branch runs all the tests we have. and. This is good, right? Because this is like actually the source of the kernel that we build and we release. So we need to make sure that it passes everything that we're expecting it to. And if we do find a failure, we can always bisect back to the faulty subsystem. And then we know the tests that are failing. So we can bisect back down to the actual feature branch merge that caused um, the test failure. So this makes the job of the subsystem maintainer and release manager easy in the sense that all they have to do is sort of look at the pre-submit results and see are they green? OK, good. Then they're confident. And um, if there's a test failure, then it's a pretty well-defined process to track down what actual code is causing the test failure or where is introduced. And again, all this is something that's done automatically. So um, all that the subsystem maintainer really has to do is run a few commands to combine the feature branches or propose a merge into our release branch and the test will run automatically and we'll be able to see uh, are they good or not. I have a couple of questions, Andrew, in the Q&A. Sure. I think the probably the first one is for Dylan. How do you separate the patch sets feature branches so that they are independently valuable or even usable, especially considering you are starting with having 9,000 patches? Partly answered er earlier, but still seems like a huge effort. So um, yeah, we're not doing all 9,000 all at once. Um, the sort of um, initial goal for Icebreaker is to get um, the all the sort of API patches over so that we can run arbitrary Google binaries on Icebreaker, but we don't necessarily have the same performance that Prog Kernel has. So that kind of uh, that actually reduces the number of patches that need to be separated out um, by quite a bit to start. Um, and then actually like separating things out into um, feature branches is usually pretty manageable, um, mainly because we have already separated out patches by effort. Uh, we sort of have effort footers that sort of organize them, saying like, OK, so this patch is for this effort. Um, and so we can sort of figure out which de dependencies exist just based off of that largely. Um, and then from there, it's sort of um, a lot of trial and error of figuring out like, okay, like what, what are the dependencies between these patches? What makes sense to actually um, define different feature branches? Because I, I think defining a feature is sort of, um, it's more of an art than a science, right? I hope that answered the question. Does that answer your question, Caroline? Yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Uh, one more question, um, Dylan. Why are these, why is the delta of two year um, upstream kernel, between upstream kernel and prod kernel, can it be reduced to something three months? Um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the goal of Icebreaker. Um, the, reason the delta is currently as big as it is is because um, we just sort of let that um, let our kernel like diverge more and more each time and so every time we want to rebase it takes longer and so the, the amount of time in between each version grows um, so uh, for, for icebreaker we really want it to be like the most recent um, upstream version Andrew, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, what I, so obviously, Google adding kernel-specific patches um, has been happening for a while, both before Dylan and I joined. But I imagine it went something like, originally, there were just like a few patches that we wanted to add. And then it kind of snowballs from there, right? You're like, oh, it's easier to just add it internally than to send it upstream. And it's kind of like a pernicious issue, right? Like at the moment, it seems like it's 
the path of least resistance. But if you keep doing this over and over again, eventually you have more patches to upgrade, uh, more patches to rebase, and then it takes longer, and then you fall further behind, and then there's a larger delta to rebase over. So it kind of snowballs out of control. And with Icebreaker, we're sort of trying to have like a clean slate, and we've done a pretty good job about it. I think we've been staying really, really close to upstream and actually uh, coming pretty close to actual convergence. So um, I think we're doing meeting meeting the goal in a sense. We're getting closer and closer. Great. Um, I think I see another hand. I don't know. Yeah, I was good. I was going to ask. Uh, so essentially, though, by with Icebreaker doing work on every kernel version, so let's say you do six versions between your two years, and deal, dealing with stuff in, within merge commits, um, but on your production kernel every two years, those patches, I assume you're essentially not using merge commits and, and doing proper rebases on them. So essentially, you've got you've created two different ways in which you're managing patches. Um, it, that is a, it, uh, and also because with the merge commits you essentially each new kernel version how do you because in a way you have to throw out that merge commit and recreate it and it's going to be slightly different each time and there's really no reason to go back to a previous version if it's midway so how I, like it's, it seems like there's a lot of uh deltas there that could be consolidated to, to make things a little bit easier. So I, I think I heard uh, two questions. There is the observation that we have this prod kernel way of managing patches and this icebreaker way of managing patches. Um, and then the second one was we're creating a lot of merge commits. Um, actually, I don't, I don't think I understood the second part completely. Yeah, just, just the merge commits in general. Like you, you are capturing the, the, a delta there to allow your rebases to go on cleanly. Um, is that done by, in order to keep it relatively small so you can manage that, do you have a bunch of merge commits for a different dispersed set of, of commits? Or is that for all of the commits that you're applying to that new version of the kernel? All right, so um, for the merge commit part, uh, you'll have to tell me if this answers your question at the end. Um, so we might have like a feature branch that's based on 510. And then to get it to 5.11, we'll merge it with Linux 5.11, right? And there might be conflicts there, but um, they're usually like, it, based on like the size of the feature, by virtue of like the fact that the feature branch isn't like a long, long patch series, it's like maybe 10 or so patches. Um, usually the conflicts we're able to resolve. And then we'll do that again for 5.12, right? We'll merge 5.12 into it. So there's never like a need to go back and resolve something we've already resolved. Um, the only time that might happen is if we're trying to linearize the lin linearize, like take take away the merge commits from the history by rebasing it onto the most recent uh, Linux version. Um, get re 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 might not save you in that sense, but you've already sort of solved the conflict, so you can just go back and look at them. Um, I don't know if that answered that part of the question. No, that, that's fine. Yeah, if you're if you're only dealing with yeah up to ten patches or so as your max, then it's not too bad. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then for the managing, uh, like having prod kernel and icebreaker exist side by side, it's uh, I, I think it's more of like a sort of organizational thing, right? So while we're trying to get icebreaker up and running, um, you can't like put all your eggs in it, right? You need to give it time to grow and for us to figure everything out. So eventually we want to shift everything over to the icebreaker way of doing things, but we still have like a concurrent uh, prod kernel rebase going on. And to add that to that, um, I think there is kind of like a liminal space where we say, um, if you get your feature on board with icebreaker and you make it to 515, and let's say, you know, the new prod kernel rebase is going to be based off of 515, um, you can say, hey, well, I have this feature branch that's already on 5.15. Can I just merge it into prod kernel? Um, and then you don't have to rebase them, right? Because you're already, you've already done all of that work. Um, and so we're hoping that like in the future, you don't necessarily have to literally rebase every single patch. Um, if you already have it caught up in icebreaker, you can merge the individual feature branch uh, into prod kernel because you have it separated out. You're, you're able to do that. 
Yeah, that, that's like one of our big selling points is that, hey, if you like do this one time effort to get your patches into Icebreaker, um, we have automation that will do as much as we possibly can up to the point of resolving merge conflicts. And even then, um, they'll be much, much smaller than you would have to deal with if you waited two years, sort of because you can like spread out the work over more time. And I think for the most part, like people are receptive to that. All right, cool. Um, I think that's, that's it. All right. So um, yeah, so we went over the automation that comes with testing. So testing at every level, feature branch level, staging and release branch. Um, but we also need some way to combine feature branches. Um, so you might say like, what's so hard about merging branches together? Um, but when you have a lot of them, it's a little bit annoying to have someone manually do that. So we have automated rules that merge feature branches into staging branches, depending on maintainer preferences. So some maintainers, um, they just want, uh, anytime a feature branch has its head moved, they want it merged into their staging branch. Um, and other maintainers, they want to have some control over when feature branches get merged. So we can set up something where like if a new tag appears on a feature branch, it'll merge it into the staging branch. So that takes care of getting stuff into staging branches. And then we have a tool to generate and upload pro proposed fan ends of staging branches. And um, this is pretty useful because it, uh, it makes it really easy to get a lot of um, testing done um, in between staging branches and subsystems. So you might have like concurrent development on subsystem A and subsystem B, but they will never be tested together until they make it to um, the release branch. So having a tool that allows us to merge staging branches um, automatically makes it really easy to combine stuff and ensure that it's like actually tested uh, together. And then uh, this automation makes it so like the overhead uh, after committing a, a branch after committing a patch to a feature branch is minimal. So you can imagine like uh, from the point of view of someone that's like uh, solely invested in uh, writing kernel patches, they don't want anything else to do with it outside of uh, committing stuff to a feature branch. Um, this is kind of like an alluring proposal, right? So we say, okay, as long as you put the stuff in your feature branch, uh, we have automation to take care of everything else. So we can run your tests for you. We can have your feature branch get merged into the staging branch automatically and make sure it makes it to our release branch. and will come like tell you if it breaks something in another subsystem as opposed to like you having to sort of keep an eye on it and uh, watch for failing tests. And so that takes care of the development side. Um, we also need automation around the upgrading side. So, so far we've, we've built automation to automatically resolve dependencies among feature branches. So some feature branches, uh, they share dependencies, right? So there might be a feature A that exposes some useful helper functions and then feature B, C, and D all depend on it. Um, so when we upgrade, we need to sort of like create a graph of features, right? So we know which ones to upgrade first. And then we also have automation to automatically attempt upgrading feature branches to the next version. Um, the reason it can't be done like fully automatically is that inevitably you'll run into like build failures and test failures and merge conflicts. Um, so the ideal case, right, is we merge the new version of Linux into a feature branch and there's no merge conflicts, all the build tests pass and then it, all the tests pass. Um, this doesn't always happen. So sometimes there's like a build failure or tests start failing. And in this case, we know who the feature branch owners are. So we can create a bug and assign it to them and say, um, hey, like we need you to do like this little bit of work uh, to get the feature branch to the next next uh, version of Linux. And um, I think this is actually a much better system than sort of having a thing where you're like, okay, these are the patches they need to rebase over two years. And if uh, you know tests fail, then you have to go search over like two years to figure out what's actually causing the failure. So doing it this way, I think like narrows the search space down and makes it much more manageable to do like every now and then as opposed to at the tail end of two years or so. And then when we combine this with our testing automation, we basically get tests on these proposed upgraded feature branches for free. So we already have the automation set up such that if you upload a patch set, we'll do the testing for you. Um, so once we attempt to upgrade a feature branch, it's basically the same thing as uploading a new patch set. So we already get the testing for free. 
And then when we combine this with the composition automation we have, we get combining feature branches for free. Um, so the big idea here is that if you can build like reusable automation, then you can just chain it and use it in uh, slightly different but similar scenarios. Um, meaning that like it, it's useful to have some infrastructure where you can run tests automatically and specify them easily. So tying this back to the themes that we had, um, staying close to upstream, we have upgrade automation that makes this easy. And I think this is important because um, usually the stuff that we, uh, the conflicts we encounter when staying close to upstream in the sense of merging from like Linux 5.11 to 5.12, the conflicts aren't like too terrible, right? Like people can usually solve them. Um, the problem I think comes from like the sheer number of feature branches that we are trying to move and number of patches. So having everyone do this manually would just take way too much time. So having automation for this kind of puts it in the back of people's mind. Like it kind of is just running automatically until there's a conflict that needs to be resolved. And then encouraging upstream contribution, we have automatic testing at the feature branch level. Um, so this makes it uh, pretty easy once you get your feature branch in to say, uh, yeah, I think I can propose this because I'm confident that it actually passes the tests I wrote. And then the test, 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 we're testing at all different levels of granularity from the release branch to the feature branch level. And this gives us a good amount of confidence that even though we're like merging in new code every single Linux release, that it's actually still functionally uh, correct before we deploy to prod. Um, and I'll hand it over to Dylan to talk about the current status and looking forward. So, um... Yeah, how are things actually going? Uh, next slide. So um, right now we're on Icebreaker 515 um, and 516 Linux just came out. Um, but it's looking like our time to actually get from one Icebreaker version to the next is uh, quicker than an upstream release cycle. So we have some wiggle room and we think that this process is actually uh, sustainable. Um, and we're noticing that the more we um, automate things, the more we practice this, the better we get at it. Um, we can upgrade quicker and quicker, even though we're introducing more and more code um, into Icebreaker. And so looking forward, um, we got to get everything fully automated. Right now we have a lot of um, CLI tools um, and sort of an on-call rotation. Um, and that's working OK, but it would really be great if we just had sort of a persistent service so that really like a member of the icebreaker team just has to um, look at emails from a bot that say like, hey, there's a merge conflict here. There's a test failure here. Um, and we don't have to worry so much about like how and when we actually perform a, a lot of these merges. Um, another, another thing we want to get done is um, if we can actually upgrade quickly enough, we can upgrade onto um, Linux release candidates instead of just the actual releases. And then we can actually participate in the testing of release candidates um, as they come out, which would be like much more exciting than just consuming the final uh, release. Um, and then from here, uh, a lot of what Icebreaker has been doing so far is just keeping up with upstream and being able to carry this technical debt. Um, I think moving forward, really, we want to say, OK, now that we are sufficiently catching up to upstream. Now we want to want to pay down the technical debt um, so that we can start reducing our, our 9,000 9, patches. Um, and that will sort of open the window to say like, OK, well, now that we've upstreamed a lot of icebreaker features, we can introduce other icebreaker features um, from prod kernel and sort of start paying more and more stuff down. Um, did you want to do takeaways, Andrew, or should I do it? Oh, I can do it. There seemed to be a question if this is a good right. time. Yeah, um, sure. What kind of tests do you use to qualify the kernel if you can share besides the build tests for different configs are just which are self describing? Um, so we have like, I guess what's the best way to describe it? Um, so we have like uh, sort of unit test like test for I want to say every feature branch we have, but I know that's not true. 
Um, but we have like, <laughs> Dylan's laughing because he knows this is an issue. Um, but we, we have like a unit test style testing for feature branches. And um, we test that for like individual feature branches and then on like levels where they're combined, right? To make sure feature A doesn't break feature B. Um, so that's generally what we use to test before we release a kernel. And then um, sort of what we test on the release branches, we have a bunch of like performance tests. Um, some of them are taken from upstream uh, test or open source test suites. I can't recall the names of them, but um, we have a good amount from there. And then uh, beyond that, we have actual like customers that are invested in like the correctness of a lot of kernel functionality. So they give us tests that we also run. Um, but obviously the further away you get from like testing an individual feature, it's usually like the more time it takes to run and the harder it is to debug. So there's, there's a big spectrum of tests we run. And I think uh, there is a big problem with our current testing infrastructure that we sort of inherited from prod kernel uh, in that it is like sort of an internal uh, test suite. Um, that has to be separated out onto its own feature branch because of that. And it, it causes, it's causing a lot of problems right now. Um, and we would really like to move sort of away from that and towards using kernel self-tests, especially for um, feature branches, right? Um, to be able to sort of develop your feature and then commit onto the exact same feature branch, your tests in self-tests and, you know, build it and run it and boot it and do everything just on the feature branch um, on its own would be, uh, I think, super powerful. And we're, we're just not quite there yet, but. So that goal is music to my ears because we have K-Unit and K-Self-Test, um, you know. Um, so that's, that's great. So I have another question. So when you run tests on your feature branches, um, right, do they specifically target the features or do you run um, a common set of tests across all your feature branch branches and focus, have additional focused feature tests? Um, so for the feature branches, like there, there's some like testing that um, that is applicable, like just in general, right? So the kernel source that a feature branch is on top of, there's like stuff that can still be tested that we want to make sure we don't want to break, like, uh, you know, make sure the kernel still reboots. Um, but usually, in general, it's just feature-specific testing for that specific feature on a feature branch. And I guess, in theory, we could be running um, like the full self-test suite on the feature branch. Right. Sure that's over. I mean, it's not going to, uh, yes, it probably won't test some of the your product-specific tests, but at least it'll make sure that you get the kernel coverage. Both right, are. right. Is the full test of suite run against the integration branch for the feature for the feature branch? Because you mentioned Dylan, so you had the kind of an integration branch also inside a feature icebreaker feature branch, right? Um, sorry, what was the question? I I, I thought I saw, I saw I saw in your branching you had actually a branch that was integrating all the feature. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, on a the staging branch, um, we can rerun all of the individual like feature specific tests, um, and then at that point we can also run integration tests. Um, yeah, and we sort of have a yeah. Currently, it's not happening to run all the tests against the staging branch? Um, so we run um, pretty much all of our core feature-specific tests uh, on staging branches on and on our next branch. And then through our release process, we do end up running like more like a customer level integration tests against yeah. just the release branch. Okay. Some of it's like, uh, like a timing issue, right? Like, you don't want to force some subsystem maintainer to have to wait hours and hours for test results to come back. So it's kind of a trade-off between like how quickly we want to allow them to be confident in their uh, integration versus like, is it okay to have them wait like a full day for everything to come back? That makes sense, yeah. 
Right. So if you were to run like KUnit or KSelf test on those feature branches, probably wouldn't add that uh, much time for you. And it probably kind of goes across all of the features that you might be looking for. KUnit especially, it's a, it's a UML kernel build, but it'll help you with the, uh, targeting certain features if you wanted to. Some, something that, that you could consider. With, uh, yes, the time and balance of time was how long do you run the test and uh, the ROI on the time versus, um, I totally get it because with the KSELF test and KUnit, that is the struggle we have. How, how long does the test suite take? Because if it takes longer, nobody will run it. Yeah, and also it's like we're using shared resources, right? So we can't just like take all the machines all the time, um, right. which would probably be required if we wanted to run that sort of level of testing against basically everything. Yeah, if you want to run everything that gets to run get, run on, on your feature branches, yes, it will take a long time. I get it. Thanks. Great. Um, yeah, so back to the takeaways that we hope uh, people have. So the first one, staying close to upstream again. Um, one of the things we learned is being close to the tip of where everyone else is makes life easier. And it's a worthwhile goal despite the effort to get there. Um, automating these processes means that you'll eventually get as close as you probably can to sort of set and forget sort of lifestyle with kernel development. Um, so like there are a lot of patches that we need to bring forward still to have them all be close to upstream. But um, we've seen from like the time it takes to upgrade and the amount of like patches that still are coming into Icebreaker that we think it'll probably be a goal we achieve and it'll probably be worth the effort because I think the hard part is getting there. Uh, probably much easier to just maintain once we have like all the automation in place. And then encouraging upstream contribution. Um, it, it, it's much more beneficial if like, well, while having a method to stay close to upstream is great for internal patches, it's even better if the patch lands in upstream, obviously, because um, outside of, I guess, responding to like, bugs that people find with it, it's much easier if it's just already in the tree that we're basing everything off of. And then testing, um, you need to automate testing at all levels. No one wants to have to manually kick off tests. So um, if you can just make like Git push the last thing a developer types, um, you'll probably be in a really good position um, where you know they just say, okay, I'm done with writing my code. Um, they send it and then you know if they get an email that says everything passed, great. And then if not, they'll probably be thankful that this email contains specific information about like what tests are actually failing. Um, yeah, so any uh, final questions? There is a question in the QA box. Do you work with a feature flag? If so, can you explain your process? Um, so I think, I think feature flags are something that we use in user space binaries to control their uh, their behavior. I don't. I don't think that's something that's applicable to the kernel um, kernel development. There is a uh, yes, Carolyn. You can uh, go ahead and unmute. Yeah. And thanks. Pass. I was curious about um, the subsystem maintainers. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that uh, the subsystem, subsystem maintainers we have to take care about their subsystem uh, in the staging, uh, in the staging setup, and that would be once every two months. Now, uh, do you think they will be overloaded, or um, as closer you get to upstream, they won't have that much work? Um, so I guess there's like sort of two responsibilities for a subsystem maintainer, I guess anyone involved in icebreaker. So there's like the maintaining the health of like their staging branch, um, while holding like the kernel version constant. So like if we're on 512, um, they're probably still ingesting merges and development into their staging branch. Um, and so I think that that one's like not too much work, right? You just make sure that the tests are passing and resolve conflicts within the code that you probably wrote are very familiar with. Um, the question about like every two months we upgrade. Um, so this is like actually sharded over 
many, many more people than just the subsystem maintainer. So while we have, we might have one person responsible for like a subsystem, just for like ease of contact um, within that subsystem, each feature has its own owner and it's not necessarily just that subsystem maintainer. So I don't think anyone's like in a position where they're upgrading an entire subsystem. I think it's much more spread out than that. Okay, understood. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And I think another thing to acknowledge is that um, a lot of the problems that we do encounter when we do the upgrade uh, is something that we would encounter uh, during the prod kernel rebase anyway. Um, but the advantage of doing it more often is that we're sort of amortizing it and spreading it out over the full you know, two year period, as opposed to sort of compressing it all into one um, critical period you know, and putting all these problems in the critical path for uh, deploying a new kernel. And I also think like is something like 60 to 70% of our feature branches, when we try merging the next version of Linux, there's just no conflicts and they just work, right? So that's like something people don't even have to worry about. It's just the other 30 or 40%. Um, that is great that you, if you can manage uh, not having too many conflicts, right? That means that you're, um, your feature, uh, the conflicts between your feature branches are take being worked out ahead of time before you need to go into the product branch. So does um, uh, this process really helps build confidence for product teams to take a new upstream, I mean, rebase to a icebreaker kernel? Is that, that's kind of your, the goal, right? That you product teams will be able to take it with more confidence? Yeah, yeah like, uh, I guess, trying to convince people that are consumers of the kernel that it's like tested in the same manner as prod kernel would be. And then people that contribute to the kernel that uh, our way of doing things is a easier proposition than uh, the long rebase. And I think prior to fully transitioning to icebreaker, there's this benefit of saying, um, you know, icebreaker 515 has been deployed in production and we've identified a number of bugs, but we fixed them. Um, and so there's, you know, it, and it's been deployed in production, not like fully, but like, you know, a small percentage, very small percentage of the fleet, but we can say 515 has been qualified in production against Google workloads. And so we can rebase prod kernel to 515 with more confidence because we've already gotten a head start in, in working with that upstream content, as opposed to before we were just sort of rebasing completely blind and we had no vehicle to test upstream with until we had actually done a significant amount of the rebase. Right, you're flying blind, fingers crossed, I guess, and yeah. going everything, hoping everything works. So yeah, that's great. So you talked about um, a little bit about uh, maybe uh, get um, it's the goal to participate in the release candidates, Linux's release candidates. Um, so do you have thoughts on when you would do that? And um, would you be participating in every single release candidate that comes up each week? Or you would target the um, merge window, the RC1, which has this bulk of the changes and then um, then the rest of it is incremental? Um, so I think the way that we view it hopefully happening in the future is that the initial like jump we make is to RC1 and then mm -hmm. everything else is incremental after it. Um, obviously there's like uh, some timing issues there, right? So it's like RC1 is released and then we try to upgrade everything. Um, it would need to be blazingly like fast to have that happen in the two weeks before the next one comes out to report any meaningful bugs. Um, so we still need to do a little bit of thinking on how we're gonna make that work with the timing. But I think we've shown that we're, we're able to jump from one version to another in less than a release cycle. So there should be some way to uh, actually make this work for jumping to release candidates. Right. Yeah, you were able to do this with um, with the seven eight seven to eight week granularity. So uh, if you hit the release, you know the, the official release. So yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. So it looks like there is a question. Um, can you share one challenging situation while migrating from prod kernel to icebreaker and how you overcame that challenge? 
Um, do you have any that jump to your head, Dylan? Yeah, tests. <laughs> um, maybe that's not a good answer because we're, we're still dealing with it. Um, but I, things are getting better. Um, I think, yeah, I mentioned before, we sort of have a internal, not upstreamable test suite that we have. Um, and migrating away from that and towards something more upstream friendly, I think is going to be essential for sustaining things in the future. Um, but it is um, kind of a headache um, because if you have a, a feature branch and you only want things that are upstreamable in the feature branch, it's sort of frustrating to say, no, oh, I can't, you know, I can't merge my, my own tests in. I have to do this weird ephemeral merge and then build and then test everything. Um, so I think um, it, it makes a lot more sense to, to leverage upstream test infrastructure. I don't know if you have anything, Andrew. Um, yeah, I think like one challenge that I think still pops up every now and then is, um, so there are applications and binaries that uh, they like assume they're running on prod kernel, right? Because up until this point, that, that was a valid assumption. If you were running in a Google data center, you're running on prod kernel. So they would assume that certain features for the kernel would be there. And then suddenly we bring icebreaker into the picture and that feature is non-existent. So they try to make a syscall that doesn't exist or open up a file that is just not there. Um, so I think an interesting thing to deal with, I don't know if it was necessarily hard, but it was interesting to think about um, like, is this feature worth porting over to icebreaker or is there a change we can make in user space to sort of get around having to port everything. And so I, I think that had the benefit of like, it helped us actually uh, move patches from the bucket of like, we need to rebase them to, um, we don't need them anymore because we were able to find a, find a user space solution. So is it a combination of, oh, sorry, um, Pascal, um, you can uh, just ask, ask your question. So maybe I missed it somewhere in the, in the, in the flow, but I work on a feature, it's been tested, it's good. So is it my responsibility to submit the patch against um, uh, the, uh, ah, the master branch or is it, or is it be part of the flow of Icebreaker to do it for me? Yeah, so um, we're trying to get it to the point where it's like your feature branch is tested and good and you can just walk away um, in the sense that as soon as like you've submitted to that feature branch, um, it'll get pulled into the staging branch and our next branch eventually. Um, so the, yeah, that, that's basically what we're trying to get to. Um, there's some like weird caveats that we haven't worked out yet. So like if it conflicts right with another feature branch, then you still need to come back and fix that conflict. Um, but, but other than that, yeah. But it's, as it stands today, so it will already do it today? So as it stands today, yeah, if you submit patches to your feature branch, um, all our subsystems have this auto merge thing going on. So um, it'll get automatically merged to a subsystem branch and then um, at that point, it's like the subsystem maintainer just making sure that the test that we ran automatically passed and then clicking the submit button. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would say it's not necessarily the feature maintainer's responsibility to uh, make sure it gets merged into a, a staging branch, but it, it is their responsibility to support and maintain that feature when something goes wrong in that process. Because um, they're the the expert after all on that in that feature. That makes sense. Yeah. So do you also run into configuration? You did mention feature syscall not supporting or those are all the runtime feature differences. And do you also run into configuration options or how do you ma uh, manage the configuration options to enable certain features across your branches? Um, so like we have a we have a way to do this where you can like add a file that'll turn on a configuration feature, but, or a config option, but I, I don't know how much we're like allowed to talk about it, but we, we have a way of doing it. Okay, fair enough.
Any other questions for either Andrew or Helen? There is one question. Every decade now, buzzwords pop, pops up in the market. The decade, this decade is AI, IoT, Meta, et cetera, with the emergence of the technology. Where do you see kernel development going? Oh, um, I'm going to cop out of this one. I've only been doing this for about a year and a half. So <laughs> maybe, maybe Dylan has more perspective. Well, yeah, I don't know if either of us are really experts on AI. Um, there's been talk of, um, you know, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had AI attempting to resolve merge conflicts? Um, but I think that's kind of a long way off. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to add. I mean, I think one interesting thing that we've sort of seen is like we're adding more ways to um, move like what would be like kernel uh, logic inside the kernel into user space? So, like an example would be like uh, cooperative scheduling. So we're able to like write schedulers in user space instead of having to just defer to the OS scheduler. So that might that might be like a way things go, but that is a very narrow uh, view, I guess. So it looks like there is a second question. Maybe it's a follow on or, or in future, does embedded have scope of innovation? Um, I honestly cannot say I've done much uh, embedded programming in my life. Thank you, Andrew. That's, that's um, more of a probably predictions type question. And there is a lot of innovation happening in an embedded space already. So. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, there, there could be more. I, you know, there probably will be more. Any other questions? Does that answer your question, Saurabh? Uh, partially, yes, but not completely. So any other questions? I think we are kind of, do you have anything anything to add, Andrew, Helen? Yeah. Um, nope, I think that's, yeah, that's uh, about what we wanted to talk about. Hopefully it's helpful for other people. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's, uh, it's some of the challenges you're facing that's fascinating. Um, Dylan, say. Uh, I was gonna say, if you have the chance, um, start start with upstream first don't get into the situation that we're in now. Um, uh, Cause I, you know, it's one thing to like try and do something clever to get out of the situation, but it, it's totally worth it to just invest and not get into the situation in the first place, so. Oh, I guess another thing is we, we have a bunch of open kernel developer positions. Um, it would be nice to have more people on our team to share the work with. Great, yeah, that, I think that people would like to hear that. Um, uh, yeah, definitely technical debt is a huge problem for not just, um, it's, it's across the board for all companies, right? So uh, um, what I'm hearing is you're doing a, a lot of automation and you are making it easier for maintainers and to, and then the product teams to also have confidence in taking, going upstream. So we're all, if I can, you know, you can see product teams um, being on kind of both sides. Product team, um, you're afraid to, 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 it's working. I don't want to do this, but at the same time, you're con continuously maintaining the patches that you don't have to. So it looks like there is a question. Have you had situations where severe bugs made it into the product kernel? If yes, how did you handle it? Um. And so like specifically about prod kernel or like uh, generalizable to like, uh, we 
how did bugs slip into icebreaker and how did we fix it? Seems um, like it's a proud kernel. They, the question, yeah. Esther, is that? Proud? I think yes. That's generally. I'd just like to know if um had bugs into pod and how we went about handling like, an icebreaker. Um. So I think in general, like uh. The way like I guess severe bugs manifest is obviously if we caught it before like we wouldn't have released the kernel so it's usually we have a big customer or someone who runs some certain workload they come back to us and say like hey this isn't working and we think it's a kernel issue um, so when that happens like generally people are it's well, once we've triaged it and figured out like where like what feature is responsible for this um, usually people are pretty receptive at like figuring out and debugging and fixing it. And then like mechanically in terms of like getting the fix out, um, we can either say like, okay, don't use this kernel anymore because we know it's bad and go back to like a previous known good kernel. Um, and then you can just wait until the kernel with the fix rolls out. Okay. Esther, uh, we cannot uh, hear you if you are uh, speaking. No, I was it that is, uh, I mean, you answered my question already. Thank you. Thank you. There is another question. Can you provide active suggestion? <laughs> so, um, this is probably, can you provide uh, provide active suggestions to millennials who want to build their kernel uh, uh, career in kernel and device style development in, in the long run? Um, is that something you, you want to field, Andrew, Dylan, or do you want me to feel that? Uh, seeing as we're probably in the same bucket as the person yeah. asking the question, <laughs> uh, per perhaps you can impart us with some wisdom. Okay. Um, so, uh, we have a lot of resources. I mean, you, the currently millennials is probably current generation, probably in my opinion, is in the best position to pursue uh, open source career, um, in any of the open source projects they would want, including kernel and device. Learning. There's so much information out there, so many, uh, resources out there and in mentorship programs and this webinar like we are doing series and um, is just very accessible. Um, I, I totally wish that I had similar opportunities when I was struggling to become a, a kernel developer. So um, uh, to answer your question is, there is so, so much, so many resources and both formal mentoring programs, internships, as well as uh, webinars and training, so many opportunities out there for you if you choose to. Does that answer your question, Shara? Uh, yes, uh, it does. Uh, if, it, if it's possible, can you provide the guidance means where should one means invest their time in kernel subsystem memory management network driver? And, and other virtualization hypervisor. So I would say whatever you have, you find it, find naturally driven to or passionate about. Because if you do not identify what is the best for you as something that you want to do for um, for the next uh, five, 10, 20 years, um, nobody can really can guide you that way. You just have to play with the different subsystems and find where your passion lies. That's what I would say. I mean, I can tell you, you. you know, this device driver, that device driver, but if you're not interested in that, you know, you will, it won't keep you engaged in that. Any other questions? Thank you, Andrew and Dylan. Uh, Marissa, um, looks like we're 
about to close out. Would you like to do your closing? Sure. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew, Dylan, and Shua for your time today. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again.